And with that, we now have a fully defined C2 orbital, where now we can write it as C2 is equal to 1 half times the 2s orbital plus root 2 over 3 times the 2px orbital minus 1 over 2 times the root 3 of the 2pz orbital. And in this case, we're going to be defining our 2s orbital as being 1 over 4 pi times the square root, or the square root of 1 over 4 pi times the radial component. We have the 2pz, which is equal to the square root of 3 over 4 pi times the radial component times the angular component, in this case is going to be cosine theta, and then the 2px orbital, well that's going to be equal to 3 over 4 pi times the radial part times the angular part, which is sine theta cosine phi. And so I'm just generalizing the radial part because it isn't important for this discussion, since what we're concerned about is trying to predict the angle between C1 and C2. And so here, that's why we're going to be explicitly, or why I've explicitly written out the angular parts being this cosine theta and this sine theta cos phi. And so if you recall, going back to our picture way back at the beginning, we defined C1 to lie along the z-axis, and then we said that C2 is going to lie along the xz plane. And so what that means for our coordinates for our various orbitals, or for the C2 orbital, is that what we're going to end up doing is we're going to be setting phi to be equal to zero, because phi is basically the angle that swings around in the xz plane, and it starts at along the x-axis, where phi is equal to zero. Since this hybridized orbital exists along the xz plane, then that means that when we plug in, in these angular components, what we can do is we can plug in for phi is equal to zero. So if we go back down to our definition of our arc C2, this hybridized orbital, we can then substitute in for these three definitions, and this cosine of phi, well phi is equal to zero, so that means that cosine of phi is equal to one. This greatly simplifies this expression, where we would have C2 is equal to one half times one over four pi, or the square root of one over four pi, times the radial part, and this is the one half times two s. The second term would be root two over three times the square root of three over four pi, times the radial part, times sine theta, minus one over two square root of three, times the root three over four pi, times the radial part, times the cosine of theta. And so in this case, we can cancel out that square root of three and that square root of three, this square root of three and that square root of three, and that we can simplify C2, again, to be equal to one over four times the square root of one over pi times the radial part, plus the square root of one over two pi times the radial part times sine theta, minus one quarter times one over pi, or the square root of one over pi, times the radial part, times cosine theta. So we are now finally at the point where we can actually answer the question that we set out to answer. Notice here that my this hybridized orbital, this C2, is only a function of theta, which is a good thing. If we go back to our picture, we see again that theta is this angle that basically goes from the z-axis and it rotates down around. Um, and since we've already defined our two hybridized orbitals, C1 and C2, to lie on the xz plane, and we've eliminated the phi component, that means that if we were to take the derivative of C2 with respect to theta and find when it's a maximum, then that angle, theta, that then we would calculate from that derivative would then tell us the angle between the two hybridized orbitals. So let's do that operation. So here we have our C2. We're going to take the derivative with respect to theta of C2, and we're going to set it equal to zero so that we can find then the angle that's in between these two hybridized orbitals. And we already know the answer is going to be 109.5, but let's now prove that to ourselves. 
So again, doing this operation, taking this derivative, this is going to find the angle between our two hybridized orbitals, Xc2 and Xc1. So taking the derivative of Xc2, we can see the first term, it has no dependence on theta, so that first term is just going to be 0, because the derivative of a constant is equal to 0. We have our second term, where we have a bunch of constants times sine theta. It's only the sine theta part that's going to be affected by the derivative. So I can write the 1 over square root of 2 pi times the radial part. The derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. For this third term, I have a bunch of constants times cosine theta. So all those terms will come out. I have 1 quarter times 1 over the square root of pi times the radial part. The derivative of cosine theta is sine theta but it's negative sine theta, and that goes with that negative sign, so I end up getting a plus, and that ends up being equal to zero. From here, I can distribute out 1 over square root of pi times the radial part. What I'm left with is the square root of 1 over 2 times cosine theta plus 1 quarter sine theta, and that's equal to zero. I can basically cancel out this 1 over root pi and the radial part, because I've got a zero on the right-hand side, and so what I'm left with then is the square root of one-half times cosine theta plus one-quarter sine theta, and that's equal to zero. If I move my cosine theta to the other side, one-quarter sine theta is equal to negative cosine theta divided by the square root of two, I'm going to divide both sides by cosine theta and multiply both sides by 4. So I'm going to get sine theta divided by cosine theta is equal to minus 4 over the square root of 2. And finally, sine theta over cosine theta is tan theta. And that's equal to negative 4 over the square root of 2. Now, if you were to take the inverse tan of negative 4 over the square root of 2, what you would get is a theta that's equal to 70.5 degrees. So let's draw what this actually represents. So here I've got 0 degrees, and here I've got 180, and I've got 90 degrees up there. And I know that tan theta is a positive value between 0 and 90 degrees, and between 90 and 180 degrees it's going to be a negative value. And what I have here is the tan of theta is a negative value. So I know that I have to have an angle that's going to be in quadrant 2, that it's going to be in this, this, this range between 90 and 180 degrees. So when your calculator does this, it only does it just for um, quadrant 1. And so that's why we get this calculator value of 70.5. What that calculator value also ends up spitting out at us is this value here, since tan is a symmetric function. So it actually also tells us that at that angle is 70.5. So if we want to know this total angle theta, which is the angle that we really want to know because this is this predicting 109.5, then what I need to do is I need to take the number that the calculator spat out at us, and then I would say 180 minus 70.5, and the result of that is 109.5. Here is an image of methane, which illustrates the geometry which is predicted for the sp3 hybridized orbital. We've always been told that the angle between sp3 hybridized orbitals is 109.5 degrees. By solving the coefficients for two of these sp3 hybridized orbitals, we've demonstrated that this angle is no accident, according to quantum mechanics. In this lecture, we examine hybridized orbitals to understand the geometry of bonds as described by quantum mechanics. A hybridized orbital is a linear combination of atomic orbitals involving a limited set of all basis functions. By using normalization and orthogonality conditions, as well as geometric arguments, we were able to solve for the constants in sp-type hybridized orbitals in order to determine their orientation. This framework justifies Lewis structures in the language of quantum mechanics and provides a theoretical basis for VESPER rules.